In August of 1941, Britain was cornered. Isolated and seemingly hopeless, it seemed all the British could do was watch as the German army smashed unfettered through Soviet lines. While a naval invasion from France was becoming less likely, stopping the German U-boat fleet's tirade against British shipping was still priority number one. So, when rumours came up of German submarines using rivers in Vichy French colonial territories as secure places to refuel, a five-man team from the SSRF, or Small Scale Raiding Force, led by Gus March Phillips, was sent to investigate. They departed from Poole Harbour on the 9th of August 1941, and set sail for West Africa, where they rendezvoused with the other SSRF members in Freetown, Sierra Leone, in late September. They searched through French and Spanish colonies, but failed to find any submarines. SOE operatives had, however, found three Axis ships on the technically neutral Spanish island of Fernando Po, also known as Bioco. The Italian merchant craft, the Duchessa d'Aosta, the German Tug La Comba, and the barge Bibundi. SOE agents on the island reported that the Duchessa d'Aosta's radio had not been blocked by the island authorities as it should have, and it was being used to communicate information about Allied ships in the area to the German Navy, who would deploy U boats to sink them. The ship's manifest did claim it was carrying civilian goods, but was conspicuously missing a page, leading the SOE to believe it may also be carrying military equipment. A plan was formed whereby two tugs would transport the commandos to raid the island and take out the boats. The plan was approved by the Admiralty in November 1941, and Churchill himself supported it, having consistently pushed strongly for controversial commando sabotage missions. But George Gifford, the officer in charge of West Africa Command, blocked the plans, refusing to release the men needed. He, like many other older officers, saw these kind of commando raids as improper, barbaric, and sure to bring Spain into the war. The plan was finally accepted on the 6th of January, as the Foreign Office decided that as long as British involvement could not be proven, the plan could go ahead. To prove deniability, the Admiralty decided that the commandos would have to steal the ships and drag them out to HMS Violet, whose commander would claim to have intercepted them in neutral sea. Undercover SOE agent Richard Lippitt, under the guise of working for John Halton Co., a British shipping company with officers on the island, began surveilling the island as the plan was being developed. Lippitt managed to gain access to a party aboard the Duchessa d'Aosta, where he gleaned information about the crew and the arrangements for guarding the ship. He also found out that the crews of the ships and the sizable Spanish garrison on the island were living a debauched life. Many were suffering from venereal disease and they frequently threw parties either in the boats or elsewhere on the island. Using all of his connections, Lippitt arranged for a party to be thrown in a hotel in Santa Isabel on the 14th of January. As such, the date for the raid was decided. But first, a few changes to the plan were needed. Gus March Phillips was given command of the operation, and he immediately went to the governor of Nigeria, Bernard Boudillon, who offered him two tugs, the Vulcan and the Nuneaton. The Vulcan, a marine service troop transport vessel, was large, powerful, and quiet compared to the Nuneaton, which was an older shipping vessel with loud diesel engines. March Phillips also decided that more men would be needed, in case the group met fierce resistance from the Spanish garrison. Boudillon offered him his pick of soldiers from the Nigerian colonial service, 17 of them were selected to fill out the raiding force, which left Lagos on Sunday the 11th. The rough seas did not prevent March Phillips from inducting the new raiders and familiarising them with the equipment, consisting of tommy guns, pistols, torches and truncheons, as well as fallbox, black painted foldable kayaks, which allowed men to move silently through the water, as well as being invisible from more than a few feet away. The two boats eventually sighted the island early on the 14th, and the crew spent the day preparing the plastic explosive for the attack. A low mist fell on the island, auspicious for the commandos, as this heavily impeded the vision of anyone keeping watch on the boats. However, not everything was going to plan. As the ships began to move forward to launch the raid at 11.30, March Phillips realised that a grave error had been made. The raid had been timed to begin at 11.30 as this was when the island's generator would be switched off, meaning there would be no harbour lights and thus almost no visibility. However, the crew had assumed that Fernando Po kept at the same time as Nigeria, when in fact they were an hour behind, meaning the raiders were an hour earlier than they thought. This meant the harbour was still fully lit. March Phillips was so stressed and so eager to strike, he intended to press on regardless, despite the massive risk of a firefight. He had to be stopped by Leonard Guise, one of the SOE men, who convinced him to wait the extra hour. A skirmish on the island would not only have been potentially dangerous for the soldiers, but would also have risked retaliation against Britain from Spanish High Command. After another agonising hour outside the dock, the lights shut off and the ships moved in. They moved into the harbour, moving towards the only lights on the island, coming from inside the ships. It was decided that the Nuneaton was too loud and too conspicuous, and so the necessary soldiers would approach by kayak to preserve silence and stealth. As such, the ship was left around 100 metres away from the harbour, and the kayaks approached the boats alongside the Vulcan. The Vulcan managed to approach the Duchess without being noticed, and her captain moved his boat alongside the Italian merchant vessel, allowing the boats to touch and the Vulcan's crew to leap aboard. And as last of the SSRF tied ropes around the ship's bollards and attached the two vessels so that the Vulcan could tug the Duchess away. The 11 other men from the Vulcan charged down into the rest of the ship, led by March Phillips. While 12 officers from the ship were attending Richard Lippitt's party on the island, there were still around 28 men on the ship. 
A few tried to resist, but none were prepared, and those who fought back would be dealt with using the truncheons, or persuaders, as the men nicknamed them. In all, 28 men were taken prisoner, along with one woman, a stewardess who promptly fainted upon seeing the commandos. The only injury for the commandos was from one soldier who tripped over a pig which was roaming around on deck. After they dealt with the ship's crew, the men rushed to set up plastic explosives on the cables linking the craft to the harbour. Over on the Lacombe and the Babundi, things were going even better for the raiders. Only the captain of the Lacombe, Herr Specht, and one of his officers had gone to Lippitz's party, meaning there were still enough men on board the ship that two were keeping guard. The watchmen spotted the Forbots approaching and challenged them as to why they were there. The kayakers claimed to be soldiers bringing Specht back to his ship, which bought them enough time to board the ships. The watchmen were so shocked they simply jumped overboard and were taken prisoner. The Nuneaton's crew, led by Graham Hayes of the SSRF, boarded the two German vessels, taking their crews prisoner, although I could not find a specific number for how many men they captured. The two ships were tied together, as the Lacombe was a tug and the Bibondia barge, so there was only one set of cables attaching them to the dock. Hayes' commando set plastic explosives on these cables, which detonated at around the same time as the explosives on the Deoster. While the Lacombe and the Bibundi came free, allowing the Nuneaton to enter the harbour and begin towing them away, the cables on the Deoster remained attached, and so the commando set more plastic explosives on quicker fuses. These went off with a much louder sound than the first set, waking anyone on the island who hadn't noticed the first round of explosions. A few locals had noticed the sounds from the dock, but had no intention of informing their colonial overlords, simply laughing as the Vulcan pulled the Deoster free and the five boats left the harbour. The Spanish Garda Colonial, or at least those of them who weren't drunk or in a brothel, rushed to defend the island. But not from the 32 men currently in the harbour, but from a perceived air raid. The sounds of the explosions that broke the cables on the three ships made the garrison think that they were under an air raid, causing them to fire AA shell after AA shell at clouds, while the naval artillery in the harbour stayed unmanned as the ships slunk away. As the ships headed away, the Nuneaton ran into a problem. The Lacombe and Bibundi began to smash together as they were still tied together as they had been in the port. As such, it was decided that the rope of the Bibundi must be let out further. However, the rope began to fray, which meant that a new rope was needed. Unfortunately, there was no one on the Bibundi to attach this rope. This meant that Anders Larsen, the Danish commander known as a Viking, had to live up to his name, taking a new rope to the Babundi while using the fraying rope as a tightrope, showing courage worthy of a berserker. With the Babundi secured properly, the two vessels continued to their rendezvous point with HMS Violet. It was vital the Axis ships be found out in open ocean, as it would be considered an act of war to take vessels resting in a supposedly neutral Spanish port. As such, the commanders, whose role had to remain unknown, would take the ships out to the Violet, who would claim to the Germans that they had caught them out in open sea, removing any involvement of the Spanish, and as such not constituting an act of war against them. The engines of the Nuneaton, which had broken down twice on the outward voyage, failed again. Although a marine service engineer managed to repair them somewhat, despite the pressure of Spanish naval launches potentially pursuing, the engines were still struggling, and the crew signalled the passing collier, the Aloran, using semaphore. The coal ship reported back to Lagos HQ, which deployed a ship to tow the Nuneaton and the two German ships back to port. The day also continued on to the planned rendezvous point in good spirits, the crew even briefly raising the Jolly Roger before March Phillips commanded them to take it down. As such, all five ships and all crew and their prisoners made it successfully back to Lagos. But the question still remained of the reaction in the international community. In the days after the raid, accusations abound across the world. The USA, Britain, of course, Spanish Republicans and even Gaulist French guerrillas were blamed. The latter was due to Gus March Phillips taking the smart move of dropping a few free French caps into the harbour as the boats left if not convincing Spanish authorities of British innocence, it at least so doubt. Spanish Foreign Minister Serrano Sunye called the raid an act of piracy and an attack on our sovereignty, while the German authorities, still unsure of what had actually happened, alleged in the Volkischer Beobachter that a British destroyer had used depth charges to blow up the anchor cables and shot the ship's crew. The mission retained such secrecy that many British chiefs of staff and British allies were never informed of the true events of the raid. The reaction on the island itself was slightly more heated. Captain Specht, heavily drunk from attending Richard Lippitt's party, barged into the office of Peter Lake, British consul to the island, demanding to know what happened to his boat. Upon being told to leave, he slapped Lake, who punched him, knocking him down to the floor. Upon seeing Lake draw for a pistol, he saw himself, fell unconscious, and was taken away by guards. As the attacks could not be proved to be British doing, authorities could not punish British officials on the island. Richard Lippitt, the SOE agent who'd arranged the officer's party, was taken in for questioning by Spanish colonial authorities, but he managed to convince them that he had nothing to do with the raid or the party, and was let go on the condition that he didn't leave the island. He accepted, but on the same night he took a canoe and made his escape, successfully returning to British waters. The three captured ships were all sold off or given to allied countries, with the two German ships being given to Liberia, and the Deoster, renamed as the Empire Yukon, being given to Canada before it was sunk a few months later. It was later refloated and repaired, being sold, ironically, to an Italian shipping company. I hope you enjoyed this video. I'm enjoying bringing history content to the channel, and the topic really is one that interests me. Um, please comment any topics you'd like me to cover in the future.